everyone, it's Debbie Potts, and I'm excited to have Stephanie Holbrook on the show today to talk about keto endurance, and we'll combine our podcast training and knowledge together to talk about metabolic efficiency, how you can become a fat burner this year, and how you can learn how to fuel, train, and perform as a low-carb athlete. Now, that's the name of the podcast, and I've had this podcast for almost 10 years. If you go back in the archives on my website, debbiepotts.net, John Smith and I started this show called Fit Fat Fast, and we did 100 episodes on how to burn fat. So if you want to get more information we talked about this stuff 10 years ago, 2011, and we went into it a lot with Dr. Maffetone, Phil Maffetone and uh, Noakes and uh, gosh, we have Vinnie Tordrich. We had so many people on in the beginning before all this was so popular and really known about being fat adapted and ketosis, nutritional ketosis and how to do fasted workouts and all that. Now the flip side is what I shared in my book, Life is Not a Race. Now, most of us here are probably similar to me that we're a little driven, ambitious, high-performing individuals in, in life and sports and we tend to take everything to the extreme. More is not always better is my lesson learned and sometimes less is more. I call it the Goldilocks effect and everything that we do and everything in our body has a right balance that we have to find. N equals one. So everything we talk about today, N equals one. Your bioindividual, bioindividuality is really essential as we are all unique. And so there is not one size fits all. There is a template you can start with and then tweak it. Ideally work with a coach that can help you figure out the right training plan and matching your nutrition and your exercise to what you're working on and what you're training for, or maybe you're not training for a race this year, maybe you're just training for being healthier and improving the aging process. So remember, that as we talk today, Stephanie and I chat about fat burning, keto, all this stuff. And my lessons learned in my book, Life is Not a Race, and my manual, the Holistic Method Manual, has a chapter of each of the eight elements. They're both on Amazon for sale. But the lesson is that I was doing fasted workouts when I had adrenal exhaustion, air quotes around that, when this all happened to my health breakdown and burnout in 2013. And since then, it's been my mission to help you avoid going through what happened to me. It didn't just start happening in 2013. It, I'm sure I had red flags that I was unaware of that built up to that final, you know, digging myself into that hole in about February, March, 2013. And since then, I haven't been the same. So I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to dig yourself into a hole over training, but it's not just overtraining, it's, it's life in general. This chronic stress that we get will impact your gut health. Your immune system is mostly in your guts. Your immune system's depressed when stress is on. Your blood sugar is up when stress is on. And the list goes on of how chronic stress impacts the whole you from the inside out. And as an FDM practitioner, we call this metabolic chaos. You don't know what exactly the root cause is. It's never just one thing. It's multiple things as we get this domino effect of breakdown and burnout. So you can learn a lot on my website. There's free eBooks and especially the one we're talking about today is about metabolic efficiency. You can find that on debbiepotts.net, head to the eBooks and they're all free. So Stephanie's here. Let me bring her on the show and we'll get started about metabolic efficiency. Chat soon. Okay, guys, I've got Stephanie Holbrook from Keto Endurance on the show today. We're both going to talk shop about how you can perform your best as an athlete this year to really work on your experience, but working on staying healthy through this journey this year, training for endurance events and working on the longevity part of it, because what we're doing as endurance athletes isn't necessarily healthy for us. So we want to find that right balance. So you're going to do these races and these crazy things that we love to do and not break ourselves down and burn ourselves out 
burn our body systems out. So Stephanie, happy new year. Thanks for joining me in our talk today about keto endurance and the low carb athlete. Thank you so much, Debbie, for having me on. I'm super excited to be here. Happy new year to you too. Yeah. So I'm excited to start this year. I know you've got a big race. You're doing an Ironman, your second Ironman this June. That Yes. The Ironman Cordling. Yeah. So part of this, I think I wanted Stephanie to come on the show and we both have, you know, coached people for a long time, I, you know, been in the endurance world forever and really work on reviewing some key concepts that we might always talk about, may not exactly understand what they mean. I do have a free ebook with a lot of the slides that I'll mention. I'll put, um, it's on the website, debbiepotts.net. So I'll put that link in the show notes, but it's really, I think, important to understand why of everything in the world <laughs> and our health is like, why am I doing this? What is the purpose of this? So like Stephanie, why are you doing an Ironman? Because you've had experience before you did one in, in 2007 wait, 2007 Seven. and Long time ago I was, actually I was there doing that Iron, which one was that oh, were you doing Arizona were no, you here in Arizona? Arizona I did Ironman Canada and Coeur I think that year but like why did you decide to do a race let's start with that why did I do the race in the first place? No, why are you I signing was... up this year? Why are you doing an oh, Ironman? Oh, 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 this, oh this year. This year, uh, it just seemed like I, when I did the first Ironman, I followed the traditional high carb, low fat uh, training. And I trained with friends and we did a lot of group training together. And it was just, I got caught up in the momentum and it was fun. But I also, um, I learned a lot of lessons about myself in training for the Ironman and doing it. And that's really, after that Ironman, I did some ultra marathons and that tanked my health. And I thought, you know, I was told if I just exercise more and eat less, I'm always going to be skinny, fast, super fit and look fabulous and be fabulous. And and I didn't end up with that end result. <laughs> so I, I went on this journey to figure out what the heck was going on. And I realized my body personally does not like a lot of carbs. And I've done, you know, I did Ben Greenfield superhuman coaching. That's where Debbie and I first met. I am a Czech Institute coach. And I learned so many things about the approaches that the template generic approach of high carb, low fat does not work for many people, including me. And I healed my body. I've been feeling great. I've been doing a uh, Maffetone training to build a base for, um, to launch off my training for base building for this year. And, yeah. For this year, for this Ironman. And I just love how I feel. I feel so fabulous. And it's just exciting. I just want to see what's going to happen with my body. And I also am training with other endurance athletes. I have, there's a large group of, of us here in Phoenix. Well, large, there's five, five that I know of. <laughs> That's a large group of uh, endurance athletes who are going to do Coeur d'Alene as well. And another reason is my son just moved to Missoula, Montana to go to college uh, and I thought, you know, how great to make a big, you know, sort of long trip to visit him, do the race, visit him, come home. That's my whole reasoning behind doing Coeur d'Alene. I am doing it as a found Ironman Foundation athlete. So if you are feeling generous and <laughs> want to pay it forward, you can donate to my fundraiser account. I could get a spot. My friend Renee, who I met here in Solana Beach swimming with her, She's an ex-pro triathlete, I found. She trained with Mark Allen and all those guys back in those days. And so she's amazing to talk to. But anyways, she's part of the foundation and she has spots for Coeur and Ironman for the, what you're doing. It's like, uh, I don't know about that, if I could do that. But I'm like, Stephanie's doing it. Maybe I should do it too. I'm I know, like, but you know it's so hard. Aren't, aren't endurance athletes the worst about peer pressure? I know, so bad. I mean, I don't, like people think like, how can you how can you like do all this stuff, this training? I was like, you know, it's a little bit of it is you get swept away with the momentum. And I think that that's something that it's really, uh, 
I started training and I knew I need to build a bigger base after Ironman Arizona. My fasting insulin levels are seven and they should be less than five. And I was like, I got to get that down. Mm -hmm. So I need to do some math training. And I had to stop riding with my friends. They all were dropping me because my math heart rate was, um, my speed was too low, too slow. And I thought, well, that's a bad sign in itself that, you know, I, my math, I should be able to keep up with them with math heart rate. And, uh, cause I used to, um, and I trained for the Ironman Arizona just with my friends and I didn't follow any heart rate training. And I just think there's, I thought about, I've been thinking about this a lot. My goal for January is to do a thousand miles on my bike. And I have a lot of thinking time doing that. And I thought, you know, there's such a difference between training and socializing. When you just go ride with your friends and you have no plan, you're just like, I'm going to show up and have a good time. That's fun. That's socializing. That's not structured training. That's not training. That's not training to do better. Um, it should be fun a- though. I mean, why do it if it's not fun? It is fun, but I think at sometimes if you want to improve your health, you have to make a little bit of sacrifices. After January, I'll go back to riding with my friends, but building my base, I have to do that on my own because it's just like a waste. For me, it's like I drive somewhere to get on my bike and then I'm with them for 15 minutes and I'm like, well, my heart rate's creeping up. I don't want, I'm not going above 140. My heart rate's going above 140. I'm, I'm slowing down. So well, it's just, but that's what you should do. I mean, I think when I'm coaching people, I, and myself for years, I've done my own training on my long rides because I need to stick in my heart rate zone, especially on right. long rides. You can place, you know, the workouts when you want to have time to do tempo or some like TT kind of time trial right. pieces in there. Then I'll meet with people that are faster. Like my friend, Joel, we used to ride, he does rides short and rides hills and to ride with him. I knew I need him when I had to do a harder workout, but when I'm right. doing a long ride, Neil and I will go ride and, you know, it's okay to be in front or behind and just go by my own heart rate. And that's my pace. I stopped training with groups of people a long time ago on Saturdays for my long ride because it stresses me out because I'm competitive and I don't want to be behind. And so I'd get grumpy and irritated and mad. I'm like, okay, I can't ride with people, even though it's fun to be social, but I like to be able to go when I'm ready to go. And I like to go my own pace and having the pressure in a group, you know, it's, it's got its place, you know, I think training for endurance events, it's, it's definitely something you want to look at who you're riding with. I I will be what after January, I'll be assessing, you know, what rides I want to go to, but right now, because I'm trying to get my fasting insulin down, I, and I have a blood test next week and I'll see where I'm at, but I'm not going to ride with other people because I'm not going to get my heart rate above my Mapiton heart rate. Yeah. So let's get focused on the definitions. I know I'm going to share my screen real quick, but I want to go through kind of what is metabolic flexibility efficiency. And I did these slides for uh, KetoCon this year and that we did from virtual, but can you see my screen? Yeah, I see you over there. So let me just, let me make full size here. So here, so learning to be fat adapted is what I think we should start with talking about today, right? We want to go over some basic definitions and it's instead of burning carbs, we want to be able to train the body when you're going endurance, especially to be reliant on fat fuel tanks instead of carbohydrates. And what Stephanie was saying is we used to be told and probably still are (laughs) my marketing is that you need to have all these sugary drinks every hour. And I still see people all the time when I'm running on trails here, biking, eating goose and having, you know, Gatorade on a ride that really your body should be burning fat. And if you want to work on performance longevity, I think that's where to start. And this podcast is strategically planned to have it beginning of the year. So you can look at your whole year calendar. So some things to think about metabolic flexibility, uh, anything, 
want to go over what that means. So metabolic flexibility is defined as ability to adapt substrate oxidation rates in response to change of fuel availability. So it's a being able to switch back and forth and depending on your main tank is your fat fuel tank, but you have your backup tank that I think of as rocket fuel. And that's what we'll talk right. on about that carb timing that we'll talk about. Not all, you know, zero carbs is not ideal. It's just placement of your carbs, your carb timing that we talked to Peter Defty that we've learned a lot from in that part of the OFM, but anything mad about flexibility you want to add here and Stephanie go into a little more. Right. Well, I, because my company is named Keto Endurance, people assume that I promote no carbs ever. And that's not really what I promote. I quote, promote burning fat as your primary source of fuel and timing carbohydrates where they give you a performance benefit without a health disadvantage. So I think that that's, you know, probably the big discrepancy in what people's perception is. Mm -hmm. And um, something that people don't realize is that your body, when you're eating a certain fuel, your body rebuilds itself with that fuel that you give it. So if you're eating fat as fuel, your body has the enzymes, the, all of that to break down the fat, it upregulates that. So when you, if you're only using carbohydrates for racing is fine, but you still need to practice with them or it won't have the enzymes and the, the system to really use that fuel efficiently. So it's, um, I, th I was talking to a friend and he was saying about Zach Bitter talks on his podcast about his high fat, low carb, and then protein stays constant. And then when he gets close to his bulk of training, it, it switches. And I would say that that's basically what I recommend. It's, you know, we both worked with Peter and uh, worked for Peter before. And I think that that's the, and I've noticed with people's just training and racing, but the amount of carb that you can do largely depends on your body, your um, health, your genetics, your um, sleep, stress, all of that. You know, if you, if your body doesn't prefer carbs, then it, it's a very, very small, small amount of carbohydrates to give that extra boost. If you are very, um, if your body likes carbs, you should still have part of the year where you take them out because excess carbs and insulin resistance is very damaging, but your level of carbohydrates that your body can handle without um, causing damage is quite a bit more than what I, than works for me. So it's like, even though there is a basic template, that's something that Debbie and I are talking about. Does everybody follow the same program? There's a basic idea or a uh, thought, you know, about periodized nutrition but those levels of fat, protein, and sugar are wild, are you know, widely different between diff different people. Some athletes I've trained, I mean, literally eat 1.5 grams of protein per pound of lean mass, and they do fabulous. And I have athletes who have some really um, problematic, problematic blood sugar regulation or blood sugar regulation problems where they they end up with a lot of hypoglycemia and any little bit of extra protein crashes their blood sugar. So it's there around 0.5 grams per pound of lean mass. So it's, you know, the template is, is there like we're a starting point to work from, but the different macronutrient ratios that work best for people vary widely. Yeah, I was, someone was asking me yesterday, do I eat keto? And I'm like, you know, I hate putting a label on it. I just say low carb or, you know, keto, whatever you want to call what you eat. I said to her, the main goal that I teach people and promote is burning fat. And to burn fat is to balance your blood sugar. So your macronutrients that you need varies per person, metabolic typing, as you said, genetics, all these different variables that we need to take into account. And chronic stress, as I talk about every episode, pretty much, is chronic stress impacts the whole you. And so if you have 
constant stress in your life externally and internal hidden stressors, as I found mold toxicity and dysbiosis and pathogens, you're going to have your blood sugar increase without having any change of what you eat. It's from your stressors. So it's really looking at the whole person and working on what I said, the holistic method to optimize your fat burning. So as you said, sleep, sleep is essential. I had a crappy sleep. Actually, it was New Year's Eve. I went to bed later last week, ran the same run I did today on New Year's Day, ran today and felt great. And last week I had to walk a lot because of this big hill and I had no energy because I didn't sleep. And so I was thinking, you know, sleep is so essential. If you want to get a good workout, you want to make good food choices, you want to be happy and be in a good mood, focus on your sleep and your stressors, right. because that's going to impact your workouts and your nutrition, your digestion, your gut health, everything. Yes. A hundred percent degree. Mm -hmm. That is why my fasting insulin is high. It's from, it's not from lack of sleep because I sleep pretty well, but, um, it was about, you know, training too hard and not recovering, but, um, yeah. Ditto what you said, Debbie. <laughs> so I don't have an aura ring, but you know, someday I'll, I'll buy an aura ring. I should have a few years ago, I was going to get it. That's like, I don't want to wear a ring all the time, but to get that feedback is really essential to know how is your heart rate ability? How is your quality of sleep? And you can tweak that from that feedback you're getting from your aura ring. But I know, you know, really training is so essential right now to do that base training. And when it's good timing to add hit training, and we'll go kind of back to definitions, but fat fuel tank versus carb tank. You can read all this in the ebook I'll put in the show notes, but metabolic flexibility when you went over metabolic efficiency is something I started doing testing on people in 2005 on treadmills, bicycle, stationary bike, and at rest. And I learned a ton and became a metabolic efficiency specialist with Bob Sebahor and just really being able to test where you are. So ideally, if you can find somewhere ever COVID, if we can ever <laughs> do these things, get a metabolic right. efficiency test to really know where your metabolic crossover point is that you're burning the most fat at which heart rates. And where is your point that crossover point that your fat burning fuel goes down and your carbohydrate usage goes up. And then we want to optimize that metabolic fat burning range through our training, as Stephanie was saying, the Maffetone training is 180 minus your age, plus or minus five beats. We'll put, you can see that link in many episodes on the math training, but, you know, being metabolically efficient, you can see on the slide, if you're watching the video, it's this crossover point that we want to look at. If you can get a test that your carbohydrates, and you want to move that move right. Yeah. You want the crossover point to go right. Exactly. We want to keep moving it right. Like when I was testing myself and had the ability to have access to my own new leaf metabolic testing cart before Lifetime Fitness bought it and just the dissolved the company new leaf. So we couldn't do any more. We could test this and it was really fun to see, okay, is my training working at that Maffetone type of training improving my fat burning range? And I could get up to 160 heart rate and still burn high, high amounts of fat. So it's how you train and how we eat. So the fuel train and perform is what we'll get into, but metabolic efficiency can read about that. Uh, Bob Sebahor's book is pretty amazing information. We've got tons of information from uh, Paul Larson. They yeah, have this is, I think this graph is from, wasn't this from, um, well, it's a very similar on, graph that they used our, in the, the faster study. Yeah. On your mark, nutrition, metabolic efficiency, it says down there, I can't read it, oh, but yeah. it's the same thing. It's the same thing as in the book of Bob before or a uh, full and Finney's book. That's where it's from. Right. Right. Yeah. And so high carb diet versus low carb diet. And I must say with the faster study, I'm sure most people know what that is, but you know, people are running on the treadmill, but it was all men. And so if we go into what I just talked to, uh, did a podcast on fasting and you have to remember N equals one and women are not small men. So all these studies are primarily done on uh, mice and then they're done on men. So you have, if you're a female you have to take into account your hormones are different than men, but that's a good, anything you want to add on this study or the faster study? Uh, I agree. 
same, samey, samey. We're Gabby and I are on the same page. But uh, I think when talking about fasting, I just noticed the email you sent out about a big group of fast, you know, people fasting. The Keon fast. The Keon fast. I think that you have to look at, I'm sure you would say the same thing. So I'm, mm -hmm. I, and correct me if you don't, if you wouldn't, yeah. but if you are really stressed out, fasting is another stress. It's no. stress is a good thing in the right quantity. And right now, because I'm doing this big block of training with lots of miles, I'm not going to be doing that. Well, that if you read, read the blog, it's a podcast Kelsey and I did. And we said, do not fast. Uh, stress and we're not fasting. Fasting means what we're doing is a intermittent fasting, which is probably what you oh. do for 16 hours. So oh, we're yeah, fasting, people get overwhelmed, like, oh my God, I'm not going to eat for five days. That's not what it is. It's time restricted eating, intermittent fasting, and we're doing a gut healing protocol and more liquids and one meal a day. So fasting oh. means different meanings of it. And that's what the Keon fast well, this will come out afterwards, is a five-day worldwide challenge with 20, 30,000 people will probably be doing it. Last year, there's 20,000, but it's not not eating at all. And that's not a good oh. idea. That's what the whole video, you got to read the, the See, I read the blog and I it started was, watching the video, but then, I mean, I just looked at it right before we okay. got on. I'm just kidding. But was, it's, the video yes. Kelsey and I did, it's a podcast that came out as well. And it is about fasting and chronic stress and who should fast and who should not fast and what fasting means. And there's three different levels of fasting and it's not, none of them are really doing a five day water fast, just different types. But just to review the Maffetone training that Stephanie's talking about doing, Stephanie, why don't you add in anything with the Maffetone, why you should be doing this in the beginning of the year when you're working on your foundation. If you break up the year into periodization, you're working on building that fat burning endurance range right now with the 180 miles your age formula. When you are training, you're, you're trying to train your body to burn fat. One way is by restricting carbs. Another way is by Maffetone, maximum aerobic function heart rate training. You're not going to be, um, if you just restrict carbs and you're doing high intensity training and are stressed, just like Debbie said, you're, you're producing sugar, that is not going to make you a very well fat adapted athlete. So it's a combination of things, restricting carbs plus base building, math, maximum aerobic function, heart rate training makes you a fat burning athlete, not just restricting carbs or just maffetone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's my whole story in my book, Life's Not a Race. And what I said in our, the intro before Stephanie, I started recording it's chronic stress really messes you up. <laughs> so, bad, you know, bad. not doing, when you're doing endurance training and you're doing it at above math heart rates, your metabolic efficiency, fat burning zones, you are causing chronic stress. If you're working out more than 45 minutes a day and you're doing that black hole training or doing too much high heart rate training, you are increasing your stress hormone cortisol, causing probably over time, HP axis dysfunction, just this whole domino effect of things that will happen that we call metabolic chaos and FDN practitioners is kind of a catch all term for all the crap that's going to happen to your body. If you don't stop finding, you know, yeah. Overtraining living life as a race, burning the candles at both ends. Yes, ma'am. I would like to say, uh, you know, I don't, maybe this will scare people. I, I don't know how people are going to respond to this, but uh, I ride with the West Valley, uh, a cycling group in here in Phoenix and I live in the West Valley. And one of the gentlemen that we ride with all the time is that every single ride, he got in 11,000 plus miles last year in 2020. And last Wednesday, we were wondering where he is and he had passed away that evening <gasps> in his sleep. And he was, he wasn't that old. I think he was in his sixties and, you know, I cannot say it enough. And I repeat it all the time. Fit does not mean healthy. Fit does not mean healthy. How, I mean, you can be healthy and unfit. You know, those are not interchangeable terms. They're not the same thing. Fit is one thing. Healthy is another thing. You can be both fit and healthy. You could be unfit and unhealthy. 
you can, you know, it, they're not the same thing. So, you know, well, that's I, what, I, that's what we talk about all the time though, right? It's you and I were right. focusing on being fit and healthy. And that's what we've talked about at seminars. And I was just trying to pull up, I was reading this last night before bed and Ben Greenfield's book, Boundless, and I'll put it in a blog, but it was about emotional it's in the moon chapter and it's about how chronic stress can lead to con- cancer and all these different health issues, chronic diseases. So if you can work on just balancing, you know, your good stress and your bad stress and having those little breaks, as I say, reset, and reboot throughout the day, I can't find it right now. I marked the page last night, so I'll put it in a blog later, but I think it's so essential. And that's kind of what my purpose is to why this podcast about health building, low carb athlete, but get healthy for the long term, you know, your longevity. And I think you have to be careful when you're training for Ironman or any endurance events. You don't get sucked into that cycle of riding when training with all your friends, running, whatever you're doing with your heart rate sky high, that that will accumulate. And if you're burning the candles at both ends, eating in a like maybe too little calories. Like you found out in our last episode we did, you were eating too low of calories. I was probably doing the same thing when I had my adrenal exhaustion begin. I was doing barely any eating. I was fasted. I thought it was just such an efficient fat burner, but I was causing probably this huge hormonal stress to my body and had this cascading events of issues. So tangent, but it is important to do the math tone training is what original conversation was. You can see all the benefits, but it's essential part of training, but nutrition we'll get to as well. Right. Right. It's not just heart rate, but, um, you know, you did training with Peter. You used to work with him. Optimal fat metabolism teaches us a lot of information. And that, I think what's a big takeaway from the optimal fat metabolism that carbs are not evil. What do you They're find? not the enemy. Well, carbs, well, this is what Peter says. He's like, Carbs are the ultimate perform, um, performance enhancing fuel. If your body is very insulin sensitive, when you add carbs, they are a, a legal performance enhancing um, tool. So mm-hmm. you don't, you know, these people are giving, like doing all kinds of performance enhancing drugs. And if you just restrict your carbs, carbs part of the year, you get the same benefit as a performance enhancing drug and it's a hundred percent legal. So that's really the big message that Peter wants to get across is that carbs are not the enemy. Carbs are a tool. And if you use them like a tool, you're going to get a performance boost. Yeah. And I always believe that we're not saying, I know your keto endurance is a name, but it's not meaning, as you said before, that you have to be in strict ketosis. We're not trying to be, you know, one point ketones to three. I mean, do you have a range you want people in? Or are you just saying like, okay, so like Amy says, I will tell you, um, as somebody who's worked with keto adapted athletes for literally 10 years, the not 10 years, probably seven years. Sorry. And uh, your ketone levels, there's some pretty telling thing. Even if you have never added a, a single um, carb, your ketones are really never going to get very high. They're never going to get above 0.5. They'll usually be between 0.2 and 0.5. If you are at 1.5, you're probably not training right, or you're taking ketone esters or ketone salts. So that's, um, which is a fault. I'm talking about blood ketones and, um, in urine, you know, the urine ketones, I think most people know this, but if you don't, you can only use those sticks for probably about six weeks when you first start, um, switching from a high carbohydrate to a low carbohydrate diet. Cause once your body initially starts making ketones and then it starts using them. So really, uh, once your body starts using ketones for fuel, the the best, most accurate measurement is a breath ketone meter, but you don't even need to measure your ketones. You can tell how you feel. I've been doing math training and I knew my insulin was too high before I started. And it, you almost feel like now that I've been doing it for a, a couple of weeks, I feel like I'm on a drug. I feel so good. And I'm, I'm drinking nothing but water and salt on my bike rides. And I feel like, you know, I feel like, oh my God, this feels amazing. And it was just because the training itself, your body is 
is burning fat and you can feel it. And, um, and something about blood sugar too, you know, endurance athletes get free. I mean, strength athletes can get their blood sugar down to their seventies, um, and eighties endurance athletes, your blood sugar will be around 95 to 105. So don't freak out about that, that it's higher than a hundred, but that's pretty normal. It's because of gluconeogenesis, your body just gets really good at making protein into fuel. Uh, the body can turn fat into, um, sugar through gluconeogenesis. So don't, the numbers, you know, when you start measuring people get bent out of shape because the number doesn't match what they think it should be. Just know that the ranges for keto adapted or fat adapted or metabolically efficient athletes are not, are not as extreme as I would say a strength training athlete. Mm -hmm. And I think people get sucked in and we talked about this many times that people might listen to keto info or follow stuff on social media, but they don't realize none of those moves, those people are not doing endurance training and especially no. training for multi-sport races and Ironman that it isn't something you can compare like, oh, they're only eating 20 grams of carbs a day. That's what I'm going to do. Try to get the same results. And so you have to remember that you're different and you got to experiment that you can tolerate low more carbohydrates, good quality food, not junk foods, not dirty carb, dirty keto, whatever you want to call it. But uh, the other question was, Stephanie, what do you think the optimal levels for your ketones? You're saying 1.5, but do you find, you know, working with your athletes is, do you really care? I think it's, what I it think is between 0.2 and 0.5. Mm-hmm. You're not ever going to get to 1.5. Or yeah. 0.7. If you're 1.5, you prob I mean, you're probably not fat adapted. Well, wouldn't you say like being showing ketones of 0.1 enough? Yeah, that's like fine. I mean, as long as some. Yeah, as long as you show ketones on the meter, you're doing the you're you're on the right track. Period. But more is like, not better. More is not better. Yes. Yeah, I think people need to remember like, oh, I'm only point because I would have clients. Cause I have them use keto mojo and, and test and I like people use NutriSense to measure, do continuous glucose monitor, combine that all together to get this kind of biofeedback to experiment for a month or so, six weeks, but realizing that you don't have to get 2.0 on ketones. You're just, you don't have chronic illness, chronic diseases. We're focusing on getting some ketones showing because we're just want you to be burning fat for fuel. We're not working on some, right. you know, you're, epileptic seizures, treating that or anything. I, I would like to say something, Debbie, that I, w- I had this conversation with a, a client of mine that endurance athletes, what we're, we're trying to teach you to do or help you to do as, as coaches is to both be fit and healthy. If your goal is only health and you do not care about training, you're like only going to run a marathon because you want to be thinner. That's not a good reason to run a marathon. So well, how many people I you lose weight. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, I, there's a couple studies out there that show, especially women, women running their first marathon typically don't lose weight. A lot of them end up heavier at the finish line. Some of it's because of the nutrition recommendations. I used to work for a team in training and manage the marathon training program. And it it was very depressing for a lot of women that they went into race day and they're like, I joined this program because I wanted to lose weight. And I think for you and me, we train because we enjoy it and we love endurance sports and it's thrilling and it's fun. I love riding my bike. I love being outside. Mm -hmm. Those are all the reasons I do. And being a little competitive, you know, it sort of scratches that itch, but don't don't think of endurance sports training as a, as a reason, like I want to lose weight. Don't, this shouldn't like the thought in your head, I want to lose weight. I want to, then I'm going to run a marathon. Cause surely if I ran that much, I would lose weight. I don't, that's not a reason to do an endurance event. Yeah. And I think that's a huge point to make because, you know, there's a lot of people that, yeah, that's not the way to lose weight. <laughs> Isn't to no. do an endurance event. Is actually 
putting your body more in stress and you have to, you know, be careful on a lot more things, especially for females and premenopausal hormones. You got to be careful. So anything else I want to get into your kind of periodization that we've talked about how to become fat adapted, kind of the process of doing that, you know, how do we get started January, February, March and what we should be doing, but anything else with what we were just talking about, you want to add on or ready to move on? No, I mean, unless you, I think that we covered, covered all the topics. Okay. So I if we want, if you kind of, well, think how many people, this is why I'm promoting intermittent fasting, the key on fasting that we will have done when this releases, but we are doing five day jumpstart. And I've created this program in my fitness studio that I had for 10 years, kind of a, a reset reboot. And I think after the holidays, people need a little reset reboot not making new year's resolutions, but just clean house, clean your body, clean your house, declutter, uh, yeah, declutter, but it's cleaning your liver and working on your gut biome and really working on taking this time to get your body ready for the year ahead. And part of that as an athlete is doing the Maffetone training. We just spoke about getting your body to burn fat for fuel, but what you're eating. So we talk about fueling training and performing. So training we talk about now fueling, how do you get your body to burn fat with what you eat and how do you eat? So, you know, for me, it's really getting people to have proper liver function. Liver congestion is huge. The liver does over 500 different jobs. And we're talking about gluconeogenesis and all this stuff. Everything happens in your liver <laughs> and you have to have proper digestion and get all the working parts in order, like an orchestra, all the players need to be working at optimal level for you to get optimal results. So it's not your training, it's what you're eating, how you're digesting your food, how you're breaking it down, how your gut's able to absorb those nutrients, all of that we should work on right now. And I think every quarter, do a little reset, reboot. So how to get your body to burn fat. Stephanie, what do you find you're doing with your clients to get them from switching from a car burner to a fat burning athlete? I would say most of the people who come to me are already fat burning fat um, as they're already, I mean, if, if they're not, we'll give, I'll give them specific macronutrients. And I usually start at 20 grams or lower of carbohydrates and then usually start about 0.8 to one gram of protein per pound of lean mass. Yep. If, and then we do Maffetone training. Mm -hmm. And I would say I, I'm a big fan of polarized training. So 80% of it's math and 20% yep. of it is some high intensity intervals to keep it from getting boring. When they are first fat burning, I keep the intervals less than 20 seconds with a, a five minute break in between. So it's just not um, just a fun workout, but not, not super um, stressful on the body and not, you know, like five intervals, not a big, big deal, just to stretch that range of fitness. And then when we get closer to race day during the build, then we start adding, we start experimenting with fuel and fuel outside of training and, and fuel inside of training. I don't know talk, if I answered your question. Well, I want to talk but, about nutrition, not training. Let's talk about how uh, you become fat burning with what you eat now. So winter time, oh. pre-train, pre-season, how are you getting the body to burn fat? So you said protein, we want to be like 0.8 to 1.0 grams of protein. Uh, and if, you, by body if you have a lot of bread sugar problems, probably about 0.5 to 0.6 grams. So if you are somebody who has hypoglycemia, we still restrict protein as well. If you have low blood sugar, if you have, yes, if you have low blood sugar and, uh, Mm -hmm. we would restrict protein to a certain amount and then add it back in, see how you respond. But you know, the starting point is lower on the, because your body will still search for getting glucose from that protein right. gluconeogenesis. 
And also I must add that most people need to work on their digestion, especially switching to a little more protein and healthy fats that your liver gallbladder bile is essential to look at as well as getting the proper HCL and your stomach acidity to break down. Are you looking for digestive? Are you looking for digestive enzymes? Is that the answer that I'm not getting correct? No, no, not at all. That's not <laughs> but, what I'm so, but yes. Um, but yeah, I think if people don't have the enzymes to break down their fuel, they probably need um, the level of fat that I recommend is above 60% of the cal calories for fat, but to satiety. So if you're, um, you know, at the minimum is 60%, but if you're starving and uh, I recommend eating more fat. Mm -hmm. So if you're, so, if you're hungry, don't just ignore that. You should have something, but a fat base, like some olives or half an avocado, hard boiled or, egg. Yeah. Yes. Or just ghee. I mean, some people don't deal well. I'm not, I don't do great with dairy. So I use a lot of ghee, but I make it myself. It's pretty simple. And, uh, and just add fat to all your food. So mm -hmm. it's, and all of, you know, if you're not doing carnivore olive oil and, um, you know, just straight fat to help with the body recognizing that fat's coming in as fuel and that you can use, you know, use it. MCT oil, your, um, it doesn't go through the same metabolic processes as other fats. So your body can tend to recognize it a little easier and use it right away. So uh, that's a good source. I mean, I know you have the, the MCT oil and heavy cream in the coffee. Um, mm, that, I don't do those that. are all I don't, but you said fast morning workout. It's on the, it, no, it's on your slide. Oh, Not that slide. you do it. Oh, down at the bottom. Yeah, you can. I had, I used to do that all the time. That's a question mark on there, but I you know a lot of people oh. do the, the fat coffee, but I just do water and I have coffee with heavy cream, just a splash of it. I've been trying to add more collagen, but I haven't made for the buttery, you know, the MCT oil, coconut oil with a butter and um, collagen. I used, I used to do that way too much. Yeah, I think that um, don't don't do that unless you're hungry. But uh, I and I found I use I I switched to decaf, but I use a little bit of collagen and sometimes a little bit of ghee, and I mix it up with uh, uh, one of those bullet mixers. And I but I don't have that every day. That's only if I'm going to have a big 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 ride, like I'm going to do on January first. We rode a hundred miles. So wow. I, I did that in the morning before the, the century. Yeah. yeah that's and I what, did all math. Hey, good job. Yeah. I always yeah. try to do my long rides, math, tone, math training, but I think I don't do anything in the mornings, weekday workouts, wake up and we work out, but weekends, if I'm going a little longer, I depends what time we start. If we start early, I just have my coffee, my water, and then some amin Keon aminos. I like to add my water. But then during the long rides, I like three hours and then I'll have something, but I just don't do well eating and working out. So it works for me to fast and just have some liquids, but nutritionally, I think, you know, what you eat, if people get confused of how to do low carb eating and it's, you know, not funny, but it is kind of funny that we get it. We make it so confusing and think people focus on all the huge lists of what they can't eat instead of just here, eat a good quality source of protein with the healthy fat. And if you're doing vegetables, you know, add some good local organic in season vegetables. And I don't know why, you know, we've gotten it so complicated that, you know, like Amy Berger and Dr. Westman have the new book out and, and your carb confusion. And, it's, it makes so much sense. Like everyone gets so confused about what to eat. I want to be keto endurance athlete. I want to be a low carb athlete. I don't know what to eat. So how do you keep it simple? Well, I mean, it depends on the person and what they like to eat, but I think that the people think that they need so much variety. Mm -hmm. You don't need that much variety. I, I mean, as you know, I followed the carnivore diet on and off for many years. Well, since 2016, I don't know if that counts as many or, <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> I feel the best when I just, I eat all meat. And I think that's super simple because you can just have meat and then be good on long bike rides. I just take meat sticks. I take uh, Duke's 
sausage little, they're called shorties. They're pretty tasty. Um, and sometimes I'll add in some ketone salts, but not to make it, I think when something's new, people have, I'm guessing, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out, like, or fear of bonking. The bonk fear is huge with endurance athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I just want to say, like, if you, if you have a fear of bonking, then you are not fat adapted because there's, you can't bonk. You, you may have to slow down, but you will never have it where you get the, the spacey, like, you know, see stars feel like, you know, you can't move and, mm. and your brain starts to slow down. And you can't think that's, that's a sign your body does not know how to access its fat stores. And it, it's a really bad sign for your health. So if you, um, you know, bonking or the fear of bonking or the sensation that you're going to bonk is a sign that you are broken and you need to do something about it. Like that should be a big canary in the coal mine that things are going mm -hmm. south on you. But uh, aside from what to eat, you know, just keep it freaking simple. Mm -hmm. And if you, the nice thing about, oh, you even have it on your slide, no bonking. Look, I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I did not see these slides before Debbie put them up. I and we're know. all so simpatico. <laughs> well, that's why I thought I better pull them up because they're exactly what we're talking about. Because I put this. Yeah. It, so. so it's, you know, just, you don't, I could literally write, because I'm doing my goal for January was a thousand miles of Mapitone training on my bike because I wanted to build a big base and I thought it would be a nice challenge and it's fun. And actually I'm really enjoying it. Uh, that um, I, I don't need any fuel because I, even on a, a hundred mile bike ride, I did take uh, a four and it's been cooler here. I took four Duke sausages. I ate two, whatchamacallit, um, what are those long meat sticks from the, the convenience store and then two pieces of uh, cheese. So that was my, that was my fuel for the hundred miles and I mm -hmm. felt fine and I recovered fine. And it was all good. And then after the ride, I drove through, um, you know, sometimes people want higher quality meat, but when you're yeah. hungry, I just drew through in and out burger and got four meat patties. And that was my post ride food. So it's not, it's, it doesn't have to be complicated. You just have to think like, you know, try it out though. Let me see how it feels. Some people you know, if I wanted to, and I wasn't, I could have done the hundred miles with just water and salt, but then I would have been really hungry, hungry later. And well, um, I don't think that that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. I don't think it's, see, that's the thing. I, I always have this conversation with myself, a long ride. Like I could go the entire ride without anything, but it, how is that helping me? Is it benefiting me? No. Am I just trying to prove something? And I think that's a, a big issue with type A athletes that are like more is better philosophy that you don't realize, well, I, yes, I could ride hundred miles without everything. And then I can brag to everyone, Hey, I rode hundred miles and ate nothing and just drink water and sea salt. Well, how's your performance? How's your recovery? Maybe I could have gone a lot faster and stronger and kept my heart rate down and felt great. Yeah. I'll something. tell you, I've done some really long workouts. I did a talking about I, your fasting email, which I didn't read. So if you get <laughs> Debbie's fasting email, actually read it and watch the video. The, <laughs> I was thinking about, I did a five day fast one time and I did some long rides and intervals. And I will tell you, I was a lunatic afterwards. I was so mm -hmm. hungry and I couldn't stop eating and I ate a bunch of crappy food. So it's, uh, I think the idea of just like more is better is just a messed up mindset. I, I wanted, I knew I wanted food. I ate good food. I ate the food they had in the gas station. Like I, a lot of times I'll buy chicharronis in the gas station. Cause I What's like that? them for what, um, pork rinds. Oh. Um, I, I like them, you know, if I'm doing, if I'm doing zero carb. So if I'm doing a carnivore right now, I'm doing the carnivore January's world carnivore month. So I'm eating meat and whether I stick with that, the rest of training, that's, you know, I don't know, but probably not, but, but I, there's meat sticks and chicharronis at every gas station. Yeah, but it's filled know. with junk too. 
So is that yeah, but, carnivore? Well, it's not real food. Well, chicharrones are just well that pork. pork and yeah, don't salt. tell me, I that grosses me out. I know they're good to have for keto and carnivore, but if I think about oh, what they're they so are, yummy. Yes. Oh my gosh, Debbie, they're so good. <laughs> I love them. Oh, do you know what I'll tell you as a carnivore, which I shouldn't eat a bunch of dairy because it's not. I my body does not react well, but I could eat this whether I was a carnivore or not. My favorite food of all time is chicharrones dipped in sour cream with uh, the chipotle, um, Tabasco chipotle sauce. Mm -hmm. Like for sure, that is like my favorite food on planet earth. And um, I don't eat it that often because for one, I'll eat the whole bag. And two, um, dairy makes me my well, cow dairy little. probably. Do you find goat or sheep cheese is fine? Cause a lot of people can't do cow pasteurized cow dairy. No, um, I can do goat cheese okay but I mean it's like well it's fine but I don't eat it a lot just because like why mm -hmm. yeah but it's, uh, I, do really I was love it. I was going to add though the primal kitchen they have a great chipotle mayo made with avocado oil oh I've had that before really and it good. is good yeah oh it's very good yes okay some okay. fat burning tips uh, I put this in the slides but I think you know pre Fasted cardio, we're just talking about. You can have some green tea, plain black coffee. Keon has a great organic coffee. Bulletproof has a great organic mold-free, toxic-free coffee. And I think people need to look at that as I've just been studying articles for clients on coffee and mold-filled foods. And that's one of them is what coffee, those K-cups and having crappy coffee, you're probably drinking bad quality toxins in there. But, um, you know, doing fasted workout, but I just had this conversation with someone about mini workouts throughout the day, just working out in the morning and then sitting all day, I don't think is healthy. So I'd rather people no. do a workout, but then do something at lunchtime means go for a walk or get outside and move in yeah. whatever you want to do, swim I've, in the evening. You time. ever use, oh, sorry. Have you ever used the Tomo, um, the Tomo, Tomero, the tomato timer? What is it tomato called? timer? No, it, it's the, it's called a, a system. It's called, what is it called? Just to get Tom, up and move reminder. Pomodoro timer, mm. Pomodoro timer. And it's for working to be an efficient worker. And what I do is it's 20 minutes on 10 minutes or 25 minutes on um, 10 minutes off. And I, when I, I do it. I take a, I walk around the block after 25 minutes, but it's so you don't get to, um, so you can have short bits of focus and not get distracted. Yeah. And when I'm working on a project, I find it very helpful mm -hmm. and reminding to go outside and walk around the block. Yeah. No, we've got this great backyard now. I'm thankful for that. I just walk up the big stairs a couple of times and go up there. I, I went, we have our new swing, you know, fixed up. So I sit and swing and <laughs> around. And then it's a, I love your pictures. I'm sure if, you, if you're following Debbie on Instagram, you can see all of her amazing pictures where she lives near the beach. And she invited me to come to visit, but my husband won't go because it's COVID. That's stupid. He should still come. Kind of, it's like you drive here. It's our friends, our sister-in-law from Phoenix. We're safe. We don't go anywhere. So we're pretty COVID safe. <laughs> we go <laughs> hiking out the door and I, I'll go swimming is my biggest group activity to stay safe we have swimming with two people in a lane i do that at lunchtime rest time i'm at home and we walk in our backyard <laughs> our bike ride <laughs> so anyways it's yeah getting outside getting breaks throughout the day i think is something athletes need to remember because i think if you just go for a run or bike or whatever you do for workout in the morning and sit the rest of the day to be fat adapted, be a keto athlete, low carb athlete, you still need to move throughout the day. And Ben Greenfield has lots of great articles on that because he's always constantly moving. And I think it's good to have that, you know, just different intervals throughout the day to get moving. So that's an important part. Um, oh, here's your slide. I was looking for it. So prep ah. base, this is what we talked about last year. So Stephanie has great uh, slide I put in for prep base build transition. We'll kind of finish up the podcast today because wrap it up in a few minutes, but I want just to touch on Stephanie and I talked about this last year in a podcast about 
you know, endurance training, Ironman period, you have a prep period, base, build, peak, race, and transition period. Do you want to touch on any of this briefly? Yeah. So, so the prep period is before you even start training for a season. And this is a good time to get a posture analysis, check your blood sugar, you know, where are you at health wise and get everything. It's like, if you're going on a trip, you're pat, you're going to go and make the trip list. You're going to see, you know, if you're going on a road trip, you're going to get the car, car checked out. You're going to get everything checked out. And this part of the training, you're going to be full keto because you're prepping your body for training. You're prepping, you're making your body insulin sensitive. You're getting those lower insulin, those levels down. And then base period, this is where you're just establishing fitness. You're still doing keto during the beginning of base period. If you're an athlete who doesn't have any blood sugar issues or um, health issues, towards the end of it, you're probably going to start testing out little quantities of carbohydrates during training, but not outside of training. If you're, if you're very sensitive to carbohydrates, they don't, you don't do well. You're not going to use any carbs during this area. If you're, if you're fine with carbs, you're just going to add carbs during training, then build period. So the build period of training, your training is going to look like the race. If you're a criterium racer, you're going to be racing. You're going to be training short bursts, uh, short training sessions with high intensity bursts. If you're an Ironman athlete, you're going to like, if you're doing a hilly course, you're going to ride hilly. You're going to train on hilly terrain, but you're going to add, if you're very insulin resistant or have a hard time with carbohydrates, you're going to only add carbohydrates during training. If you're an athlete who is not sensitive to carbohydrates and you do well with them, they don't cause you any damage. Um, if you're your body's good at regulating its blood sugar, you're good with inflammation, then you can add carbohydrates outside and during training. Then during the peak phase, this is where your, um, de your intensity stays high, but you're decreasing volume. This is when you're tapering and it's one to two, it could be one to two weeks. Um, and then you're going to reduce the amount of carbohydrates to really increase that insulin sensitivity and doing keto on rest days on larger training days you can still still use carbs race period this depends on the event you're going to eat the carbohydrates that you tested at during training one of my biggest peeves is like mm -hmm. before race day people are like well why am i going to eat on race day i don't know what did you eat during your whole build period yeah, that you should know exactly if you don't know exactly what to eat on race day, or if you have a coach that gives you a, a meal, a food plan that you didn't practice, then that is a don't, that's not a good coach. Don't, don't do that. You should, are, and you're not, I mean, just a new race day, you got to practice with it. Yeah. Practice, practice, practice. And you should know exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, what to eat on race day. Well, that's why you or, race and if you simulator days. Just... Right. Yes. You should practice transitions. You should practice the terrain during the build period is a big extended race practice. Um, and that includes food, includes your clothes, includes your bike setup, you know, everything. And then the race period, and then after race, uh, one to four weeks, this depends on if this was your A, B, or C race. If it was your A race, you probably need a big tra recovery period, tra uh, transition period, four weeks. Some of it is during this time, this is a great time to go on vacation with your family that you don't have a training schedule. You're just going to move and have fun. It doesn't mean to do it, nothing. It means just to enjoy life Active and recovery. Move. Right. I, it sort of makes me crazy. These people who train, train, train all the time and never have a time off. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think that's good for your mind. It's not good for your body. It's not good for, well, just of your relationships with your family. Yeah. And if you realize emotion, have it, I think a lot of it, yeah. people are just, you know, it's how I used to be just uptight all the time. And you're just always about training and what your workouts are and just a little more up. Yes. Tight. This is the time where you're just going to be, you know, 
an active person, but not think of yourself as an athlete. And if you want, I think, you know, reverting back to keto to resensitize yourself. But if you, if you're a pretty healthy person, if you want to eat whatever, like you're going on vacation and you want to have like a, a hot dog and a crappy bun, you know, then do that in the transition period. Just don't make a habit of it. Like, I think that, you know, let your hair down. Well, I don't totally agree with that. <laughs> I think you can eat. I think you still should eat real food and not just think I. Well, now this morning when people exercise, they think I'll take that back. They when people are training or racing, why I think people don't lose weight is when they screw their hormones up and they're. But they think right. they can eat whatever they want and eat crappy food. And you still need to. You are what you eat and what you are able to absorb and break down. You got to always feed your body with good fuel for, you know, good health being fit and healthy. And I think a lot of athletes just think they can get away with things, but over time it will catch up to you. Yeah. Well, I think especially to be my opinion about training, you should be more strict. The, the harder your training is, the more strict your food should be because you're rebuilding that system with the, the ingredients that you put in your body. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, it's not, if you did a hundred mile bike ride and then you rewarded yourself with a piece of, you know, chocolate cake, you know, that's not good for you, but it's not, but that's what you're repairing your body with is, is uh, a lot of times made with industrial seed oils. I mean, I'm a, yeah. you're causing I, more I inflammation. Think, yes. So, and you're just not going to recover. And then, then people use anti-inflammatories, which I'm very much against anti-inflammatories during um, training because that's masking what your body's, your body, inflammation is your body trying to heal itself. So, mm -hmm. but if you're going on vacation, if you're going to eat a piece of cake, don't do it while training, wait until you're on vacation. I am not saying like stuff yourself, like you're, you know, it's your last meal, but you know, if, yeah. if you get in the habit of eating, you know, good food, you're normally going to gravitate that, but do it on your off season. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's my point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so lots of information in this show. I know we'll try to get, do a show together once a month. It'd be great to just talk about yeah. low carb athlete, keto endurance, because it's the same thing, just different names for it. But really right. what Stephanie's doing more of the coaching part writing your training peaks and I'm doing more of the health coaching part. So figuring out what exactly are your external life stressors, trying to work on those and work on your diet, your nutrition, I hate the word diet, but nutrition and your sleep and your exercise, right amount movement and working on proper digestion, gut health. And a lot of that is what, as a practitioner, I'm doing the, the lab testing, identifying those hidden stressors. Like why is your blood sugar higher? Why is he, why are you having insulin resistance? What's going on in your microbiome? How's your bacteria levels and your pathogens mold? And so we test all that with different tests like the organic acids test and Dutch hormone panel and all sorts of stuff. But I'm a big believer of looking at what is under the hood because most athletes endurance exercise and I was reading too, exercising in hotter weather, you're causing more damage to your gut, causing leaky gut. So you always have to work on a gut healing protocol. I think having bone broth is really great to do those other gut healing drinks that you can do to work on that mucosal barrier and repairing it. But I think Stephanie has lots of good information. What's the link to your website? It's keto endurance. Keto endurance. Dot co. C -O -C -O -C -O -C -O. Co. Co. Hey, no, and, yeah. and I have a special, a special for all of Debbie's athletes. I write training plans and I will, if there will be a link to ketoendurance.co slash low carb athlete. And it'll be, I'm offering half price on just a training plan with two consultations. So it's not, um, it's not really, it's, it's not coaching. I'm writing a training plan with, you know, a description of like the season. We'll have an initial call and then a follow-up call. And then you get the training plan. So it's typically $99 for six weeks. And so it'll be $50 for six weeks. And wow. it's like as many weeks as you want. Good deal. That's cheap. Yeah. It's a special January. Spe well, I'll do it by the end of February. It'll be the cutoff date because okay, this February. is coming out late. Yeah. The video will be out first and then we'll put the 
the podcast audio version will be later. So make sure you guys, if you're just listening to this on a podcast audio version, make sure you head to the YouTube channel for low carb athletes. So you can watch the video and the slides and see Debbie and Stephanie chatting. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I curled my hair for you, Debbie. I know. Look at that. Did the hair? Yeah. That's perfect. We get ready. Got dressed on the top part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I have my swimsuit on underneath this because I have master swimming after this. I'm going to. So got to, you know, dress for podcasting and dress for swimming all at once. You never know. All right, Stephanie, have a good month training your math tone train and getting your bikes rides in. And I will uh, do the same. I actually am signed up for Ironman Canada that I did last sign up for that. last year, but I don't know if I am doing it, but we'll see. <laughs> oh, well, if you decide on Coeur d'Alene, it would be super fun. I don't know if my body should I'll mess it up again. Well, what's, can, what's Canada? It's end of August. Uh, kind of oh, well, that's close. Well, and then you're, well, June. Oh my gosh, my race is in June. Right, yeah, I was like, what are you fun. talking about? It's two months after your race. <laughs> August, <laughs> end of August, not April, end of August. It's like, oh my gosh, there's a, something about being an athlete that just makes time go by so fast. Like, boom, the race I is know. here. It does. Yeah. It will go by that fast. Keeps everyone busy. Yeah, you, you can't do both. No. No, but okay. I wouldn't do okay. both. I'd do one or the other, but... Anyways, racing is something to do that's fun and you want to make sure you're working on your performance, but think of longevity and not break yourself down. So hopefully you guys picked up some new tips and help you get started for a training plan 2021 or other years. You may be listening to this different times and reach out to me, debbiepotts.net or stephanieketoendurance.co for more info. <laughs>